I welcome you all to the Museum Studies Program's first ever virtual brown bag event. My name is Kerstin Bond, Associate Professor of German and Museum Studies, and this is my first academic year serving as the director of the Museum Studies Program. The pandemic-related closure of our campus in March forced us to cancel an already fully lined up series of brown bag talks. We are now resuming this series in a new format that brings two closely related talks from our March series into conversation with each other. I'm just delighted to begin this year's Museum Studies program event cycle with a focus on one of Michigan's most renowned museums, the Henry Ford, and to welcome back two recent graduates of our program, Brad Taylor and Calder Fong. Before we begin, let me just add a few words about procedure. We will first hear both presentations and then launch into an open conversation that includes the audience. Um, Amy, could you stop the screen share so that um, we can see the speaker? So if you click on speaker view, then you would see me. Um, so before we begin, let me just add a few words about procedure. We will first hear both presentations and then launch into an open conversation that includes the audience. Please write into the chat function if you have a question or comment and stay muted until we call on you to pose your question. You can note your questions and comments in the chat while you're listening to the talks or afterwards. We will then call on you in the order we have received your questions. And now I will introduce our first speaker, Brad Taylor. After 17 years of serving as Associate Director at the Museum Studies Program, Brad retired on August 30th. He leaves us deeply grateful for all he has done to build up the program through his tireless energy, mentorship, teaching, networking, research, and good humor. The program would not be the model program it is today were it not for Brad's work and commitment. Brad received his PhD from the University of Michigan and was a student here in the museum practice program in the 1970s. In addition to his work on this campus, Brad has served as a consultant to museums, served on museum boards, and published on topics related to museums. He maintains a special interest in the effective response to museum objects and in the variety of factors that inform it. Brad will be presenting today on work he has been recent researching since he was a student. In the course of preparing a 50 minute presentation, he's convinced that he now has enough material for a book and at least two new university courses. I think he may be busy in retirement. Please help me welcome Brad back to the Museum Studies Program. Thank you, Kerstin. Um, it's wonderful to be back with you all after a break of five weeks. It's the shortest retirement I've heard of, um, but I'm delighted to come back and talk about a content area that's been a real passion of mine uh, for a number of years. Um, when I was in the museum practice program, I did a year long internship at the Henry Ford um, and I worked there as an, uh, as an undergraduate student as well. And so I've had a lifelong interest in things related to the museum and the village um, with a particular interest in the buildings in Greenfield Village and how they came to be there. Uh, so I'm going to use that as my starting point and then focus in on a particular building uh, that has a, a compelling story to it. Uh, that calls up real questions about um, notions of originality and authenticity in museums. So Henry Ford, for those of you who aren't from the area, 
uh, and, and uh, don't know much about him, uh, was uh, an automobile pioneer uh, in, the early 20, in the early 20th century. During the latter part of his life, uh, Henry Ford uh, built a museum complex uh, called initially the Edison Institute that's comprised of a 17 acre museum and an outdoor museum that includes over 100 historic structures. Uh, those structures were large, where none of them existed in Dearborn, Michigan at the, um, at the time. Each of the over 100 structures has been relocated from another part of the country or another part uh, or another con continent. There, today, there are over 100 buildings in the village. And when it opened in to the when it opened in 1929, uh, the village had a core group of maybe 30 or 40 buildings in it. Ford had spent uh, the early part of the 20th century, the 1910s and the 19 teens, um, experimenting with preserving historic structures on site. Um, he preserved his uh, childhood birthplace in uh, Dearborn, Michigan. Um, he preserved some inns uh, in the Detroit area uh, and an inn in um, Massachusetts near Boston um, early on, but these were restorations that he did on site, so it didn't involve moving anything. The time that Mr. Ford was involved with um, building Greenfield Village, there weren't any precedents for him to follow. There weren't books on historic preservation. There weren't books on relocating historic structures. Um, there was simply a notion on his part uh, that this was a part of American history that was vanishing quickly and that he not only wanted to save it, but that he wanted to organize and collect these buildings. So while he was collecting objects for his 17 acre museum, it was, also, it was also building a second museum, an outdoor museum of historic structures. Um, Henry Ford lived until 1945 and most of the buildings that are in Greenfield Village today um, were brought there during his lifetime. They've added a few buildings since uh, Mr. Ford passed away. Uh, but what you see today in Greenfield Village is largely an artifact that was created by an ambitious individual during the 1920s and 1930s. As I said, all the buildings in the village today were um, relocated from other places. Um, and the one that I want to concentrate on today is a jewelry shop that came from London. Um, and it's called the Sir John Bennett Jewelry Shop. Let me screen share and start showing you some pictures here. That's what the building looks like today in Dearborn. Uh, and this is a building of undetermined age that was relocated from London. Um, Henry saw this building in the early, in the late 1920s. Uh, he and his wife would travel to the UK on occasion to check out his business ventures in the UK. Um, and on one of those trips, Mr. Ford was attending a church service uh, down the street from this particular building. And during the church service, he heard the clock tower figures that you can see above the front entryway striking the hour. And it's a distinct sound that can be heard from some distance. Ford had a lifelong interest in anything relating to clocks and watches. Include, uh, so today there are five buildings out of, a, out of 100 in the village that tell the story of early clocks and watches and watchmaking. Uh, one of them being the display of a watchmaker's bench in his birthplace. Uh, he was always interested in fixing watches and clocks. He brought two buildings from Detroit that were buildings where he knew the owner and visited with them when he bought parts for his watches. And he, bought this, he brought this building in from England. And there's a building called the Swiss Chalet that's almost never been open to the public. 
It was a joint venture in the 1930s with the Cartier firm, the Cartier jewelry firm. And the idea was to have Cartier watchmen creating watches inside the Swiss chalet and visitors being able to watch the Cartier, uh, Cartier watch people and buy watches at the same time. World War II interrupted this venture and it never went forward. But today, if you uh, look around, you can find the Swiss chalet uh, on the lane of homes in the village. So Mr. Ford heard the, bell, heard the bells ringing at this church and he uh, rushed out of St. Mary Le Beau and down the street to find out where that lovely sound was coming from. And he saw the clock tower figures over the Sir John Bennett jewelry shop and Ford knew that he had to have uh, of those clock tower figures. Um, and Henry had an, a British agent, a man named Herbert Morton, that represented him in all of his business dealings uh, for um, museum acquisitions. And Ford never, uh, never attempted to purchase something directly. He was concerned that uh, people were going to be jacking up the price on him um, if uh, they knew that he was buying. And so this man named Herbert Morton, who was an engineer by trade at one of his production facilities in Manchester, England, uh, negotiated with the then owner of the shop to purchase the clock tower figures that you see there for $3,000. And they were, there's a close up of them that, that there are four figures there. The two giants are named Gog and Magog, and they're mythical early creatures that protected the city of London. And behind them are Father Time and a guardian angel. And this was Ford's initial interest and predominating interest in the Sir John Bennett jewelry shop. Uh, in the late 1920s, he offered $3,000 to purchase the clock tower figures, which were then removed from the facade of the building and packed up, shipped by train to a boat waiting to take them across the Atlantic, received in New Jersey, repacked on a train and brought to Dearborn. Notice that I didn't say that Ford purchased the building. Ford purchased the clock tower figures, which were removed from the building and brought five years, five years before Ford bought the building itself. Uh, Ford brought the, bought the clock tower figures and didn't have anywhere to display them. Uh, they were just sort of part of the mass accumulation that was being brought in uh, for, the, for the village and museum. Herbert Morton, his English agent, notified him in the late 1920s that the Sir John Bennett jewelry shop was scheduled for demolition and in fact was in the process of being demolished and asked Ford if he was interested in purchasing the building. So five years after he had purchased the clock tower figures, Henry offered $1,500 for the building itself. So he paid half as much for the building as he did for the clock tower figures. And the building was already in the process of being demolished. And so Morton's crews came in and first of all needed to stabilize what was left and do their best to take down uh, what existed. There's a street shot of what the building looked like in London. Um, you notice that it looks different in many ways than the shot of the building that I showed you initially. First of all, it's a five-story building in London and it was reconstructed in Greenfield Village as a two-story building. Um, and you can see also that it was in, in a very busy shopping district in London on a street called Cheapside Street, which is located behind St. Paul's Cathedral. And it's one of the oldest parts of London. Uh, and it, which, it was considered for hundreds of years to be the commercial and market center of London. So these buildings were built right next to each other. Um, and so you have an issue of shared walls with these buildings as well. Um, so what was sent to Dearborn when Ford purchased this building was the facade of the building, the front of the building. 
there was no time to go in and make drawings of what the interior of the building looked like, and nobody took photographs of the interior of the building. So there was no notion of what the interior of the building looked like. And the only way to reconstruct the building was to use this single photo of the facade as a guide in reconstruction of the building. One of the things that um, the, the Morton's team did on this, uh, on the facade of the building was to make an attempt to number uh, the various pieces that were coming off the facade of the building uh, to be used as a guide in the reconstruction of the building. And so they took the materials um, from the, they took the building materials from the facade, um, they identified them as best they could, they sent them by train, by ship, by train, they were deposited on the location where they are today in Greenfield Village, and Henry Ford's architect, the man who was expected to reconstruct the building, first heard of the building one day when he was walking around the village and he found a pile of building materials in this location and he asked what it was and he was told that it was the Sir John Bennett jewelry shop from London, England and he was expected to reconstruct it. Um, so right then and there, notions about originality of historic structures uh, and the challenges of maintaining originality and authenticity um, are brought um, into examination, sort of given the state of the art at the time. No building would be preserved this way in the 21st century. But remember, Ford and his team were working without a playbook at the time. They were making this up uh, as they went. Their intents were pure, but they were working very quickly and without precedent. And so that's how this, uh, this building was reconstructed. You see, I want to go back to that first build, first shot, and show you, if you look on the left side of the building, what do you see there? You see windows. There were no windows on the sides of the building. It was part of a city block and had shared walls with other, uh, build, uh, with other buildings. It's a five-story structure compressed to two structures. The Gog and Magog figures in Father Time and the Guardian Angel were initially displayed on two different stories and they're brought together on a single story here. There was a large clock um, that was perpendicular to the front of the building uh, and it was a spot that was used on the street to identify the store and it was replaced in Greenfield Village uh, by a clock in the watchtower up at the top of the building. There was significant discussion about the entryway to the building. Um, the shop in London was probably built sometime during the 18th century. Uh, but Ford had concerns about the fact that a Georgian entryway didn't look sufficiently or authentically British. And so there exist uh, architectural drawings um, of a Tudor entryway or a faux Elizabethan entryway designed for the building uh, in order to make the building appear more authentically British. So this was a case where they were willing to uh, actually redesign something uh, that, they had that they had received in what we would deem today its original state uh, and recast it um, in some notion of what's of what might be more authentic than that. And so many changes, many similar changes were made to the building. So I said there was uh, the interior was being demolished. There was no record of the interior. And so the interior was completely redesigned by Ford's architectural staff. Um, and it was used to uh, display, uh, at the time that I worked there, Ford's collection of watches, clocks, and jewelry from a variety of different cultures and for, from a variety of different uh, time periods as well. So no, no attempt was made to 
reconstruct it um, as a 19th century British business. Um, the clock tower figures used to be powered by a weight-driven system that was operated by hand. And even when I worked in the village, the, the clock person in the village would go and wind the clock twice a day. In a restoration in the 1990s, all of that was removed um, and, and it's now automatically um, powered. And so many different changes have been made uh, to the building over the years. The elements that were identified on the facade of the building are all incorporated on the reconstructed building, though they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily on the facade. They've been used as decorative items on the two sides and on the back as well. So you can say that, uh, yes, uh, many of the original features of the building are here. They've just been deployed and used in different ways. So um, in my interest in the reconstruction of buildings in Greenfield Village, I seized on this one, uh, which I thought um, um, made a really compelling case uh, for uh, what, what we might learn today uh, from the practice of historic preservation early in the early 20th century. And it calls into question notions of what is or is not original, which is a really sticky thing in museums, uh, I think. And for during the years that I worked there, this was presented as an original structure. Uh, the language uh, has been corrected uh, since then. Um, but I think uh, that uh, when Ford was working on this building, he had every intent of faithfully reproducing a historically uh, a, a authentic structure to the public. He wasn't trying to put anything over on anyone. I think these things just sort of change over time. Sensibilities change over time. And so part of what I've learned in this is to get away from the notion that uh, the concept of originality is dyadic, that it's not, yes, it is, or no, it isn't original. I think there are lots of shades of subtlety um, inside uh, historic reconstructions. And if rather than trying to finger point and say this either is or isn't, we can look at um, the complexity that these structures offered forth to us, offer forth to us um, and consider what that has to tell us today. And I think that uh, there's much more to go here. I think I'll leave it at that so that Calder has plenty of time to share and we have time for questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That was wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, I would like to jump immediately into discussing your talk, but we do have a second talk today. And um, Brett, if you could stop sharing, um, that would then allow Calder to share his screen. Um, and I will introduce our second speaker, Calder Fong. He finished his PhD in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures in December of 2019. So just uh, half a year ago, well, a little longer. I think a year ago, you defended your dissertation. It was October 16, if I remember correctly. Um, I looked it up. <laughs> so Calder, um, graduated and then went on to complete his museum study certificate with a practicum at the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation this year. For his dissertation, he researched the transformation of German coal mines into landscape parks, art spaces, and nature areas. Before coming to the University of Michigan, Calder received a Fulbright Research Fellowship to study industrial archaeology at the Technical University Mining Academy in Freiburg, Germany, and earned his BA from Dartmouth College with a major in German studies and a minor in chemistry. Calder harbors a keen interest in everything rusty, 
including processes of decay, but as his talk will show, he also takes great interest and care in preservation and rust prevention. Welcome, Calder. Thank you, Kasten. Um, let's see here. I, um, I just wanted to get into this as quickly as I can so that we have plenty of time to talk. Um, I am going to present, um, this is rather ill-advised, but I'm going to present the um, talk that I was um, scheduled to give uh, in the wintertime before um, COVID wrecked everything. Um, and because I am a very visual person, I will uh, include all of the original slides that I was going to present. I'm just going to snap through them a lot more quickly. Um, and so I want to make sure that everybody uh, watching and listening um, just uh, feels free to either note in the comments, uh, in the chats uh, as I'm presenting or take notes or whatever, um, so that uh, whenever a slide comes up that uh, you'd like to return to, um, we can do that in the Q&A sessions. Um, I will at various points pause over slides where I list a few sort of lessons that I learned from different um, different departments working at the Henry Ford, um, but I'm not going to, you know, just read them aloud and sort of spell them out uh, the way I might have otherwise. So uh, without further ado, let me just jump right into it. Um, so yes, I entitled this talk The Deluxe Engine, uh, Lessons from the Life of an Industrial Heritage Object at the Henry Ford Museum, and we'll get into why I gave it such a bizarre title in a moment. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who made this possible. Um, little Michigan M's right next to all the folks who are from the university. Um, so the practicum that I had was three months at the Henry Ford, jumping from department to department, uh, basically following the course of an object, namely this internal combustion engine made by the Crossley Company in 1877. Um, and this object was important to Henry Ford himself, but um, in a way what it allowed, what following this object allowed me to do is to get a little sampler platter of all the different types of work that go on within the museum. So I started out in conservation, so um, you know, cleaning things up, uh, making sure it's, uh, as Kasson said, rust prevention. Um, so here is the machine um, with all of its historic dust and grime and Robert, grease. Could you, share, could you share your screen? Whoops. We don't see your screen. Oh no, I'm not sharing the screen. I got no too problem. excited. No Thank you for interrupting. All right, yeah. share screen. So um, do, 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 do. here we are, present. So conservation, um, here's the machine. Um, yes, if I neglect to do something, please uh, interrupt me. Um, uh, just trying to stay on time here. So this is the Crossley brothers, um, and they were the first company to have the um, patents to uh, make German combustion engines outside of Germany. Um, and there I am. Uh, and so here's the reason I call it a deluxe engine. It's because um, the conservation folks uh, like this deluxing compound. It's sort of a, if you imagine something, the color and consistency of uh, cookie butter, the stuff that you can get at Trader Joe's that you can spread on toast and pretend you're having breakfast instead of dessert. Um, you just rub it on and rub it off. The problem was, of course, that this is a um, specific, uh, it was actually designed for um, uh, furniture and the company that made it ceased to exist, got bought out and they stopped making it. So fairly quickly ran into a, a problem that uh, is kind of unique to conservation, which is what happens when the materials that you're using to do your job cease to be produced. Um, and so just had to sort of slap together some solutions and use other kinds of waxes and grit and stuff like that to um, shine, polish it up without stripping the historical uh, patina and all of that. So I did a little bit of uh, before and after and you can see a little bit more glare and um, richer dark tones in the um, cleaned areas. Um, and there's my lessons for conservation. Um, uh, we can come back to that later if we want to. Uh, went from conservation to collections management, which is dealing with storage and moving things around and making sure stuff is uh, uh, 
housed properly um, and can be found later, which is a, a kind of a problem because the warehouse that um, the machine was in to begin with was this giant collection of uh, all sorts of things from the history of the Henry Ford that weren't on display. Um, and some of these things weren't actually documented or are missing accession information. So um, this, uh, what I was doing was part of a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, to actually uh, catalog, conserve, and move to a new, uh, more modern storage space. Um, basically everything in this entire building. And when I came there, it was, you know, a tiny fraction had been uh, processed. And when I left, another tiny fraction had been processed, but uh, quite a lot remained. So I took this additional shot uh, from the corner so you could see a little bit into the rest of the hallway that we were working in um, because we had to clean it out and um, you know make it accessible for the um, forklift operators. Um, you know, our job there was pretty straightforward, making sure they didn't back up into anything um, as they loaded it onto their, you know, flatbed truck and brought it into the more modern uh, storage space where you can see everything's a lot more clean and orderly um, and so forth. Um, while I was in um, uh, collections management, one of the other things I would do would be to, um, you know, assemble crates for other artifacts um, and, foam them and stack them and label them and to use the um, the museum's uh, little ma uh, collections management software to document all of the different uh, conservation steps that had been taken with each object, where it was, um, in what box it had gone to, and so forth. Um, some lessons we can return to. Um, and from there I went to digitization because one of the things um, that I did once it was there was help out the photographer to um, basically block out this object um, and take photographs of it so that they could be digitized and uploaded to their website so that um, it could be, uh, so everyone can have access to it uh, from the internet. Um, so, and then having gotten this photograph um, of the object with uh, you know lighting making sure everything's equally illuminated uh there are not too many bright glare spots um uh everything you know we had to set up white boards so that um when i went in there with photoshop to cut out all of the background i wouldn't have to uh deal with all of the details of that fancy carriage in the background so i had to deal with um you know, white balance, uh, folks who have been, uh, remember that whole um, argument about whether the dress, what color the dress was, we'll understand that white balance is a really important thing to get right. Um, dealing with, and that's a much more subtle difference, but lens distortion, if I go back and forth, you can see the effects of that. Cutting it out, uh, deleting the background, uploading it to the website so that, um, Anybody at home can find it on the website, add it to a collection, and actually sort of self-curate their own little digital collections for, a, um, for an exhibit. So that is digitization in a nutshell. Uh, next, I went to the archives and library. And um, one of the things I was doing there was just indexing. So one of the things I had to do was fetch uh, visual objects from the archive that had not been indexed. Um, you know, this is basically the document version of a warehouse full of um, uh, random objects, um, except that it's, uh, luckily in my case, I was looking at um, visual objects, so that was a lot more fun to look through than just um, random receipts and things like that. But I, uh, here I had to develop ways of doing that much more efficiently and so I just came up with a, um, a Google form that I could use on my phone and just process things while standing in the stacks um, and ended up with a um, Google Sheet full of data. Um, but while I'm doing that, you know, you find fun things like uh, Herbert Morton's uh, photo album of going around with Henry Ford through the uh, British countryside looking for industrial ruins. So um, this is when they went out to find Fairbottom Pops, one of the first steam engines. Um, I think what a, was it a new common engine, uh, possibly. But uh, this, uh, you know, kind of 
awoke my interest because here they are, these um, innovators of the, the sort of the new technology, at least American technology museum model. And what are they doing by going out and finding old rusty machines that have been overgrown, um, surrounded by uh, uh, dilapidated brick buildings and so forth. So I rather enjoyed that. Um, another picture, so. Um, just to enjoy. Um, and then I started getting into more historical questions for the Crossley engine that I was kind of following around um, and found some um, documents in the archives, um, but a lot more questions and a lot of, um, you know, by doing this research in the archive, learned a lot about the methodology of uh, Henry Ford or lack thereof when uh, collecting objects and what was important to him at the time in, in such an object, um, namely things like, uh, well, what is the technological history about of this rather than sort of more of a the kind of history we might do today, thinking about what does an object like this mean to people. Um, you know, here it's mostly just uh, technological details. Um, going, uh, uh, Brad hooked me up with the unpublished memoirs of Herbert Morton and was able to find a little bit more information, but a lot of dead ends. Um, but that's uh, fine. That's just part of learning how to um, deal with the historic record that you're. Uh, presented. And so that um, memoir does contain some pictures of uh, old machines in the way that they were originally displayed at the Henry Ford. Um, so that's that for archives and library. Got to hurry it up now. At the registrar's uh, office, um, one of the main impetuses for me to do this practicum around the um, engine was because it had been requested for a loan um, and basically had to go through all these steps anyways. Um, the loan uh, was requested by um, a Pennsylvania uh, industrial museum um, along with uh, another object to a similar nearby um, technology museum. And so one of the things that you have to do when you loan an object out is appraise it. And, um, you know, for an old uh, engine that nobody is selling anything remotely related to, um, you have to do a little bit of historical research and a little bit of conjecture. Um, you know, eBay is one of the first places where they tell you to start looking when you have to appraise an object. But um, obviously nothing came close to uh, this. You could get a Deutz uh, diesel engine from 2012, but you can't find something from 1877. But looking through the accession and deaccessioning files of uh, the registrar's office gives um, a lot more information about the history of an object that isn't necessarily in the archives. Um, and so with this, I was able to track down a few more letters back and forth, nothing that actually gave any kind of number about how much it might have been worth it at the time so that you can just adjust for inflation. But there was an auction in uh, 1985 where they in fact sold some fairly comparable machines. And so I was able to take the data from those sales adjust for inflation uh, and apply the kind of the, the Henry Ford factor, which is, um, you know, not just the sale value, but also the sort of cultural value, the historical value of an object, which is, um, you know, not something that there's an easy formula to determine. Um, and then finally, curators, I will try to um, wrap this up quickly. So my interest, of course, is in industrial heritage. Um, and one of the things I was learning uh, in being at the Henry Ford was how the whole museum operates as a business as well as a um, sort of conservator of our um, material heritage. Um, and one of the things I was looking at is the power and energy um, exhibition because these are the kinds of objects that I'm most fascinated by but in a way these are this is one of the oldest uh, unchanged exhibits at the museum issues like only one person of color in a um, fairly tucked away um, 
portrait. Uh, the only depiction of a woman is uh, a cartoon of a or cartoon or um, newspaper illustration of a woman getting uh, injured in an accident in a factory. So these are kind of um, signs of the sort of the perspective with which the um, exhibit was originally sort of uh, put together. Even now, today, the um, if you there was a sort of marketing uh, onboarding uh, to get with the brand, and you know, in a list of sort of the internal the the museum's internal list of its most um, most key. Uh, artifacts, uh, nothing from power and energy is in there, not these like giant Gothic steam engines that are impressive or anything. Um, obviously the ones that they do have listed are very important, uh, but it just shows uh, ways in which, um, you know, there's potential work to be done. So I was going to uh, do some research, uh, do some visitor studies to try to get a sense of, you know, what people think of nowadays when they go through an exhibit of this kind of old industrial stuff. But, um, you know, thinking about certain questions, but COVID happened. And so you can't really do visitor studies with no visitors. Um, so I put together a bit of research on sort of tapping into my uh, previous work on sort of the aesthetics of industrial objects, um, as well as some more sort of statistical um, survey information about how people perceive uh, industrial heritage and um, basically presented this information in a um in sort of a presentation kind of like this to uh folks in at the museum uh, on my way out so um last little uh lessons from slide and that's it thank you thank you calder um this was this was so fascinating because you know it it really provided you provided us with a wonderful overview of your internship experience and also you know this is also a model internship experience i have to add where you you know through your presentation we had a really nice behind the scene look at uh, at the henry ford we also learned with you some skills that you picked up on your way you know through these um three months um and uh it involved research and the presentation of your research to back to the henry ford so um really fascinating um we have 15 more minutes and um I think there are many ways to uh, ask questions to both Calder and Brad, but you can also please feel free to ask a question just to Brad or just to Calder. You don't have to write your question. You know, you have to. You don't have to write out your question. You just have to let us know um, in the chat that you want to pose a question and then unmute. Then we'll call on you, you unmute, and then you can ask your question directly. Who would like to start? Brad. So uh, along the lines of things that I wish I'd included in my presentation, the ending which is the fact that during World War II, the street that the jewelry shop on was completely bombed uh, by the uh, attacking German warplanes. And the only place to see an example uh, of architecture from 18th or 19th century London from Cheapside Street is in Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, so there is Mark. Uh, Mark has asked to un unmute and then Carla. So please, um, Mark, can you go ahead? Yes. 
Oh, I'm... yes, we're he hearing you. Yes. Right. I didn't have a question, however, so I'm not. I'm a little... Okay. Okay. You, I, I can I can address some of those questions, maybe. But, uh, Brad looks like it's going. Okay, Carla, would you like to ask? Sure. I thank you both, and it's lovely to see you both. Um, Calder, I wanted to ask you about the museum's current collecting in this area. Are they still building collections? And what, if they're not, what kind of things should they be collecting? Um, one of the things that I learned about, uh, learned while I was there, um, and I had this on one of the like lessons learned uh, slides, but um, uh, my analogy is collecting is to curators as swimming is to sharks. Uh, you constantly have to be collecting in order to define uh, what, um, you know, how the museum is um, defining itself in a way uh, with respect to its interests and um, uh, political climate uh, and things like that. Um, you know, I've been out of the loop for a few months, so I'm not certain what the um, the collecting uh, the collecting uh, schwappelt. Um, sorry, my German just pops up for no reason. The sort of collecting emphases or um, uh, goals are at this point. I think Mark might be able to tell you that, but he probably can't. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, I mean, I, one of the things for me is that uh, I think it's difficult for me to advise collecting more industrial heritage. I think um, obviously I want more of it to be preserved, but I think in order for that to actually happen effectively, um, you know, a lot of uh, investment can be done in uh, making the, the fantastic collections that they have in terms of these kinds of industrial era um, machines, um, just making them more accessible and more um, easy to understand the, the, what I think to be the very compelling um, physical forms and histories of these things, uh, just making that more easy for the average visitor to really grab a hold of and uh, value. I think that that's um, where my kind of point of view would come into play there. Yeah, and, and I mean, you showed that, you know, the, the, that looking into the provenance of the objects that uh, the collection holds is very, you know, uh, uncovers rich material that that then can be brought back uh, into into displaying the objects in a new way or in a new context. So we have a few questions here in the chat. Uh, one very specific one to Brad is the weather is the weather vane on the Bennett Building a dragon? Is that from the original building? And then another one um, from Allison. So that was from Tracy. And then from Allison, um, this very precise notion of historic preservation, perfect reconstruction of a historic object or building is actually relatively recent. Does it say more about our current society, having resources to worry about the finest details than it does about history, the historical moment from which these artifacts come from. So this is also for you, Brad. And then I also would like to call on Estrella to unmute because she has questions for both Brad and Calder. Estrella, are you here? I am, yeah. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. My audio is a bit funny, so I'm um, sorry if that ends up being cut up. Brad, I had a question for you. Awesome. So in Cheapside, what was the reaction when this building was taken away? Was there a sense of, oh, why is this American taking no. away our nice building or? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so there was little to no reaction about the building's removal from Cheapside because it was in the process of being demolished already. Um, th there is an other case, however, uh, of the Cotswold Cottage uh, being removed from a village uh, in a different part of the UK. Uh, and that 
process sparked such um, concern that legislation was introduced into Parliament to prevent similar removals of historic structures from the country uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So in the case of this building, no. In the case of another building, uh, it made a huge difference. Now, the question about the weather vane, uh, the answer is I'm looking at it, the historic photo that I have here. I can see that there's a weather vane on top and the photo cuts off right at the figure on, on the top of it. So I can't tell <coughs> whether or not uh, the, dra the, the dragon that's at the top was original to the building. There was a vein. Do you know, Mark? I do. It, it, it is original. It's probably <laughs> received the attention of Mr. Ford's craftsman back in the day, but when we um, when we did extensive renovations on the building, which I think was in like 2002 and three, uh, we got quite up close and personal with that dragon. It was actually brought down to conservation. If I could just get to it quickly, I could share my screen, but I can't. So it's a, it's a quite gorgeous beast, but it, uh, it, it definitely uh, came from the building. Uh, it was, was very sensitively restored and uh, is a wonderful to hear. Yeah. So, and Allison, your question about changing notions of, of what matters in the process of preservation, you raise a really interesting point. Um, and I think that the practice of preservation has changed considerably over time. But what I think is fascinating about this is I suspect that the end goal is the same for each generation, that they approach it with integrity uh, and with sincerity, with the best tools that they have available to them at the time. Uh, and even though, in retrospect, this fussing over the front, the, the front entryway to the shop um, um, seems uh, a little bit ridiculous, trying to take a perfectly good doorway and making, uh, and making it more authentic by creating something different, the goal was the same. The goal was an interest in authenticity. Uh, so um, that's part of what I find really interesting about this is while the goal remains the same, I think the approaches to that goal and the understanding and thinking about it evolves with each generation. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, but you also show that this notion of authenticity is always a notion that already includes construction and very willful construction. So, you know, the, 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 the notion of authenticity is, it changes over time but so does the idea of, of, of this, this sort of constructed Britishness. Mm -hmm. So when so, they, when they, um, when they made the decision to construct the entryway in this way and not in the, not in another one, they made a decision for this kind of Britishness over another one. Right. So, so I, I, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. We've been focusing on sort of the physical aspects of the reconstruction but I think there are broader cultural aspects to the reconstruction too, yeah. that, I, that I indicated that it was part of a busy commercial district mm -hmm. and now it's not, it's completely missing that context. And to the extent that that helps define or situate a historic structure, uh, having these structures excised from their settings um, is potentially problematic. And it can be overcome in different ways or addressed in different ways. But uh, in the process of trying to be authentic, we need to consider the con context uh, and not just the physicality of the structure that we're preserving. Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, Aaron has a question um, about conceptions of authenticity and education that might be a nice follow-up to what we were just discussing. discussing. It is, it's just been prefaced. You all set it up beautifully. Thank you so much to Calder and Brad for this. It's just such a treat. Um, I just wanted to dovetail on a little bit about this, the subjectivity of authenticity. When we would go on our, uh, you know, very generous tours of the Henry Ford and uh, the other museums that we visited in, in the Museum Studies Program, these behind the scenes kind of, uh, you know, really fascinating ethical questions and these personal stories about how you interact with collections are so juicy. They're so interesting. And I think that they, you know, they retain the, the dignity of the viewer to consider what authenticity might mean to them and seeing how that's constructed in the material 
but also through the history of these institutions as both fallible and as you know creators. And so I just I always think that's such a useful um, place in that transparency to bring into education and to bring that to other kinds of publics who aren't just kind of specialized you know students of you know museum history. Um, so I wondered if any of you knew of any buzz or ways that these kinds of stories are being operationalized in didactics or in the you know, educational arm of, of the institutions. What do you think, Erin? Well, <laughs> I think there could be a little more space for it. <laughs> but. So something that something that occurred to me, and I worked in that building for a couple summers as a as a guide interpreting the space for visitors, and it was a collection of mostly 18th and 19th century high end jewelry and clocks that came from a variety of cultures, and people would come in and they'd walk around the space and they'd get uncomfortable because they didn't really understand what was going on there, um, and it was just not a comfortable space, but many people came in with a question about their grandfather's railroad watch. <laughs> and everybody's grandfather back in the 70s seemed to have a railroad watch that had been gifted to them. And it was a point of pride for those families to share those stories and even for the old guys to trot out the watches. And it just occurred to me that I wish there had been space yeah. Uh, in that place to um, encourage the sharing of these sorts of stories, right. uh, to use the framework of clocks and watches to allow people to find a bit of themselves in that space. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Calder, what do you think? Um. That's a great question. Uh, so I wasn't really involved in any of the um, sort of more pedagogical um, efforts uh, that go on within the Henry Ford. Um, so I'm not certain what to report there. Um, yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, they're doing a ton of really interesting stuff there, um, or at least certainly, um, the last time I was able to be on the inside. Um, but I, my, when I hear the sort of questions about, um, you know, ideas of authenticity and sort of the, the educational value of it, part of me wants to like, you know, just change the subject and talk about, you know, the education <laughs> value of um, things like wonder, you know, that don't necessarily need to be authentic because it's something that you feel. Um, and I know that we're all aware that uh, there's too much dodging the question going on these days, but I, one of my sort of, um, one of the things I really took away from walking through the power and energy exhibit at the Henry Ford is just pretty much the number one um, object that people seem to interact with there is the uh, generate your own electricity wheel. Um, mm. And that's not an authentic piece mm. of industrial technology, but it's something that people can un interact with. It's something that people can uh, see and know exactly how it works when they see it um, and know how to interact with it without any kind of um, anything. Because uh, obviously there's um, signage that tells people, you know, what does it actually mean when you spin the wheel and all the lights right. go up. Um, but it's kind of, you know, when I think, I think about education from a very sort of like bottom up standpoint. So I'm not thinking about big top down ideas like authenticity. I'm thinking about what do people actually notice and do mm -hmm. when presented with these objects. Yeah. Um, and so from there, I would try to weasel my way up to authenticity, <laughs> but um, yeah. So yeah. long answer to why I'm dodging the question. Um, no, I get it. And it's interesting because you have something like the deconstructed Model T, right? With like without with a very short um, didactic, that in some way does illustrate notions of process, right? So I think that there are ways that even without there being then you know a guide, which was so helpful when we came, other ways to engage that. So I think it is in certain ways certainly already happening. 
Thank you. This is a uh, um, fascinating conversation, uh, multifaceted. I just also wanted, I don't want to forget to note that the Henry Ford is open. Uh, the museum in particular, um, Greenfield Village will open again in November on the weekends. But the museum that Calder worked in um, of American innovation is open to visitors um, via timed tickets. And um, the current cohort of museum study students will visit the museum. And uh, we are very, while we are sad that we cannot come and, you know, I cannot bring the entire group to the Henry Ford uh, this fall, but uh, we will have a, um, a virtual conversation um, with, with Patricia, Patricia um, uh, Moruvian, the, the, the CEO and director of the Henry Ford um, in our seminar later this term. So um, thank you again. Uh, for your presentations, Brad and Calder, and for um, pioneering this new format that has uh, many advantages. It, of course, I would have loved to sit with all of you in a room, but this way the circle of uh, the audience was much broader and also included people who are not living nearby and um, also uh, many uh, um, uh, you know, many, many people working at the Henry Ford, which we were very happy about. And um, I wish you a wonderful weekend. Um, enjoy this warm fall weather. And I hope to see you back. Our next event is on October 22nd. It's a Thursday in the afternoon. And at 4 p.m. it, it will um, focus on a, um, on reimagining Detroit's cultural and museum center, a new landscape project that is um, going to bring the museums uh, and, and other cultural institutions uh, at the center of Detroit more into conversation with each other and also make it easier to walk, simply to walk from one museum to the other. I also wanted to thank Amy and Deirdre um, for um, setting this up, for organizing it, you know, organizing this event with me, and um, for being on the MSP team with me. So um, thanks to all, and um, I'll see you soon. <laughs>